Good evening and welcome to Bible Study Hub, the place where we go verse by verse through the Word of God and let it transform our lives. I'm Ann Wiggins coming to you tonight via a pre-recorded Bible study because I had to work this Monday night at 9 p.m. Eastern time. I went ahead and I recorded it to run live. So you all who are with me right now at uh, Monday, 9 p.m. Eastern time. I want you to go ahead and interact with each other like you always do on Facebook and YouTube. Make your comments, say hey to each other. But I personally will not be interacting and responding to you because it is a pre recorded one. Well, enough of that. Let's get into why we're really here tonight. And that is to continue our study in the book of Exodus. We've been through chapters one through seven. We've entered now the plagues. And what we just said last week was with the first plague that we covered, which was the Nile River turning to blood, that with every plague, God is not only showing himself graciously to Pharaoh. And, and if you're wondering about the word graciously, God could have annihilated Pharaoh for his opposition to him. And he doesn't do that. He gives him chance after chance after chance, showing his power and, as I was just about to say, decimating the Egyptian gods in the process. So we will continue with the plagues tonight in chapter 8. And as we said last week, we're just going to keep hitting on these Egyptian gods and the one true God will show himself to be victorious and powerful over all of them. All right, let's just pick it up right in chapter eight. So verses one to two, let's get rolling. It says, then the Lord said to Moses, go into Pharaoh and say to him, thus says the Lord, let my people go. And as we said last time, it's actually send my people forth. It's the actual words that they may serve me. But if you refuse to let them go, behold, I will plague all your country with frogs. Now, you might be wondering what goddess or god is being attacked here, and it's a god. I'm going to pull up a picture, goddess actually, named Hecate. And you can see there from this, what do you call that, a relief or something, and carving on stone from ancient times that indeed, not surprisingly, this is a goddess with the body of a person but the head of a frog. That's one picture. Here's just another. I don't know if she's making dinner with those instruments or what she's doing, those things look really scary in her hands. But anyway, so she is a frog goddess. And that's really important because of the plague that is about to come. So she was the goddess who represented like fertility, creation, pregnancy, childbirth. And in fact, the Egyptian women were so concerned with making sure that they pleased Hecate, especially when they were pregnant or giving birth to children, that they would actually wear little um, amulets around their necks with uh, a picture of a carved picture of this frog headed God. So they really, really revered Hecate and they felt like she was important for their national fertility and also for their personal fertility and safety in pregnancy and childbirth birth. Now, what you need to know about this, because it's going to be really important in a moment, is that so revered was Hecate that it was illegal to intentionally kill a frog in Egypt at this time. So if you killed a frog on purpose, you in turn would be killed. You got the death penalty for that. That's how serious they took this goddess. And this is part of the reason, I'm sure, why God chose frogs as a plague. He didn't just pull these things out of nowhere. What would be fun today? I don't know. Let's do frogs. There was a purpose, very, very strong purpose behind every plague that he gave them. So now we have another assault on Egyptian fertility, and it comes in the form of frogs. So let's read on here. It says, the Nile shall swarm with frogs. By the way, the Nile, as we read last time, had everything had died in it. So this is even a, like a next level miracle because now all of a sudden the Nile is going to spawn frogs out of nowhere. Um, the Nile shall swarm with frogs that shall come up into your house and into, I love the detail, and into your bedroom and on your bed and into the houses of your servants and your people and into your ovens and your kneading bowls. The frog shall come up on you and your people and on all your servants. This is a 
thorough plague. I want to tell a quick story here about frogs. This will probably make you laugh. Don't, don't laugh at me too hard, but it's a true story. It happened about maybe nine years ago, 10 years ago. We were pretty new to Pennsylvania where we had just moved. We had a friend come and visit and he wanted to go to see Philadelphia, of course. And so it's about an hour from where I live. So we we took off on a Saturday. We went to Philly and we did all the sites, you know, and he really wanted to go to Chinatown for some reason. And so we thought, well, we've never been to Chinatown before. That sounds like fun. Let's go walk over there. So we did. And there was this tiny little Chinese, like authentic Chinese market on um, a, a really steep corner of, of a street. And I said to my husband and our friend and our kids, I said, oh, I want to go into that market. And they were like, you do? Why do you want to go in there? I said, oh, I love that stuff. I mean, they've got all this cool stuff that you never see anywhere else. I would love to go into the Chinese authentic market. And there was this tiny little Chinese older lady standing outside. I don't know why she was out there. She's probably waiting for somebody. And she was overhearing me explain this to my husband and family. And she looked at me and she just shook her head. She had a very thick Chinese accent. And she said, you're not going to like it in there. You are not going to like it in there. And I said to her, I was a little offended. I said, no, I, I will like it in there. I love the multicultural stuff. You know, like I can handle this. And so uh, we we go into the market. My kids come in, my husband, we all go in. And it was a really tiny little market kind of in a U shape. And they had shelves lining the outside walls. And then down through the center, all they had was big, I think they were plexiglass tanks. And these tanks were full of frogs, live frogs. I mean, frogs upon frogs. And the frogs were like, ugh, like you know, climbing over each other and kind of lethargic. And some of them are like, ah, and all of a sudden I, I felt it. I felt the vomit. <laughs> it was coming and I gagged and I had to run like a crazy woman out of the store. Like I was knocking people out of my way because I thought I was going to throw up on the frogs. And I run outside and I'm kind of, for, if you're wondering, I didn't actually throw up. I managed to hold it in, but I was <laughs> came out gagging and kind of heaving. And the little Chinese lady <laughs> looked at me. She said, I told you, you were not going to like it in there. And I was forced to admit she was absolutely right. So the reason I tell this story is because until that moment, every time I read this story, I mean, it just sounds like, ooh, frogs, ugh, gross. You have no idea how gross this plague is. I cannot fathom how freaky would it be that, and, and you saw the detail, it's in your bedroom. You pull the covers down. There's frogs in your bed. You go to lie down. You're covered in these frogs. You go to eat. They're in your bowl. You go to take your bread out of the oven. Oh, there's frogs in there. They're everywhere. They are crawling on you. They are crawling all over your stuff. Oh, it just gives me kind of like bad goosebumps even now because of my experience in that store. And to make matters worse, the people can't do anything about it. They can't kill the frogs. They're not allowed to. And even if Pharaoh said, okay, we're going to put a moratorium on that rule, go ahead and kill the frogs, um, they're too afraid to kill the frogs. Because even though the one true God is showing now over and over, and he will continue to do this for a few more plagues, that he is superior over all their lower case G gods, they are still concerned about the ramifications if they assault Hecate, the, the frog goddess. And so they're up a creek with no paddle here. There's frogs everywhere. They can't do anything about it. I assume that they're throwing up and getting sick just because of my experience with it. It's just so utterly disgusting. You can imagine the children just frantic and crying. And what are you going to do? This goes on for a while. This is the situation that Pharaoh has created because he's hardened his heart toward God and he opposes him. You just don't want to oppose God. You just don't want to do it. You'll always lose. Verses five to seven. And the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, stretch out your hand with your staff over the rivers, over the canals, and over the pools, and make frogs come up on the land of Egypt. 
So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. But the magicians did the same by their secret arts and made frogs come up on the land of Egypt. So the magicians, again, duplicate the miracle that God does. And we talked last week, so if you missed this, you might want to go back and listen to a week prior that's nicely organized on YouTube, uh, Bible Study Hub. You can find all the videos there um, lined up with the books of the Bible that we've taught. So easy to find. But anyway, if you if you kind of missed it, what we said last week was, did the magicians really duplicate the miracles or was it more like a magic trick where it looked like, but it was just sleight of hand? And where I personally land on this is that the Bible says they did. So right there, I'm like, okay, I believe that they did. Number two, they would get their power from demons and Satan and demons and Satan are not a compliment, just a statement of fact, very powerful. They can do things that people cannot do and they can empower people to do things that are supernatural if they want to. So I believe that they would have had the power to possibly do the replication of these types of things. But the third thing is, if they're not really doing these things, then it kind of lessens the effect when God slaughters their little G gods. So to me, it was important that they were actually doing these things. But number four, and I'll add one more to that list tonight, the next plague, they try to duplicate and they can't, which tells me if they can't, like what, they just couldn't do another magic trick? Um, the fact that they can't do the next one leads me to believe that, yeah, they really did do this. But here's the point of that. Let's just let's just say for the sake of argument that, yes, they actually were creating more frogs to duplicate the miracle that Moses and Aaron had done through the, through the power of God. Can you imagine the people? Like, watch this, guys. Bam, there's more frogs. He would be saying, what is wrong with you? Would you stop it? If you're going to do something, get rid of the frogs. Don't bring more frogs like we need more frogs. We're already teeming with them. And I think the point of that is they couldn't. They couldn't get rid of the frogs. So they could duplicate creating the frogs and making the problem worse, but they had no ability whatsoever to solve the problem. They couldn't undo what God had done. They could simply counterfeit sort of the miracle. What an excruciating experience this had to have been. Verse eight, then Pharaoh, who remember <laughs> had been off in his palace for the whole Nile turn to blood situation and didn't come out and didn't really have to deal with it. That same Pharaoh is dealing with the frogs and look at his response to that. Then Pharaoh called Moses and Aaron and said, plead with the Lord God to take away the frogs from me <laughs> first and my people, and I will let the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, Pharaoh's had enough. He, he says, um, this is kind of getting to me now, and so I don't like it, and so I'm going to ask you to take the frogs away from me and my people. And I just thought to myself, isn't it interesting how people don't change when other people are suffering? People only change when they themselves are suffering, and so God needed to make sure that that happened to Pharaoh, and he did. Moving on to 9 to 11. Moses said to Pharaoh, be pleased to command me when I am to plead for you and for your servants and for your people that the frogs be cut off from you and your houses and be left only in the Nile. And, and he said, uh, tomorrow. Okay. Moses said, be it as you say, so that you may know that there is no one like the Lord, our God, the frogs shall go away from you and your houses and your servants and your people. They shall be left only in the Nile. Okay, I don't know about you, but when I read that, my first thought was, tomorrow? <laughs> what is wrong with you, Pharaoh? You could have said, oh, please, right now. What, like, when is your next break? Because on break, if you could just squeeze that in for me, please, let's just get that done ASAP. And he doesn't do that. Here is the reason I believe why this whole little exchange. I don't know if you caught it. But when, when Moses says, um, 
be pleased. Don't miss the sarcasm here. Moses is mocking Pharaoh and he's mocking Hecate, their little frog god, because when he says, I will plead with the Lord to cut off, the translators nailed it. It means cut off, like cut down, like mow down, like chop. It's it's a you know, it's a violent word. And so here's here's what's going on. Moses says, Oh, Pharaoh, it will be my pleasure to ask my God to annihilate your little gods. When would you like it? We can do it anytime you feel like it. And I'm sure it just frosted Pharaoh to be made fun of and to have his Hecate God be the one who was going to have to go down. I mean, Moses could have said, let me pray to the Lord that he'll just, you know, poof, and all the frogs just gone, just disappear. But he doesn't because it's very important that the frogs who is illegal to kill them, all of them are going to get slaughtered by God at the same time. So Pharaoh, I'm sure in his fury, but he needs something from Moses. He can't leave it like this. So he can't just say, never mind. He's like, well, then let's just do it tomorrow. Like, it's not a big deal. I'm fine. Everything's good. Yeah, it's not a, It's not urgent. <laughs> we'll just do it tomorrow. And in doing so, <laughs> he made it worse for himself and for the people. Let's go on to verses 12 to 14. So Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh and Moses cried to the Lord about the frogs as he had agreed with Pharaoh. And the Lord did according to the word of Moses. The frogs died out in the houses, the courtyards, and the fields. Are you picturing this going on? And they gathered them together in heaps, and the land stank. But when Pharaoh saw that there was a respite, he hardened his heart again and would not listen to them as the Lord had said. Well, the people have to be freaked out. And did you catch what they did? They they start getting their little Egyptian bulldozers, you know, you can just picture this. They're driving them with their little chariot bulldozers and they just start piling the frogs that are now dead and rotting and the flies and the stench and all of it. And they're just piling up piles and piles and piles of these dead, disgusting, decaying frogs. And you might be thinking, well, why didn't they bury them? I mean, you're in the desert, you know, dig a hole dump the frogs in, cover it up, or get a great big rip-roaring fire and start throwing barrels of frogs into the fire. Like, get rid of them. What were you thinking? Well, you probably know what they were thinking. They can't burn these frogs up. They can't bury these frogs. I mean, they can't do anything. Their hands are so tied by these stupid frogs because this is like the patron animal of their God, Hecate. And Hecate's responsible for their pregnancies and their births and all of these things. And they don't know what to do. So the frogs are all dead. So this is not a good scenario. This doesn't bode well. But the last thing they want to do is make it worse, like make the goddess matter by burning all the frogs or burying all the frogs. So they don't know what else to do. They just pile them up. Now you've got like a biohazard and you can only imagine the smell and the, the infestation of flies and bugs and disease that would come from something like this until they finally rot on their own in the sun. Absolutely amazing. What a victory for the one true God too. Let's not miss that either. Praise God for his power and that he always wins. He, he's never got his hands tied. He's never handcuffed to anything and he's gracious and loving and forgiving. And even in this, the plagues are shots across the bow. I'm the one you want to worship. I'm the one you want to um, believe in, not these little gods. I'm decimating them. Let that mean something to you. So he is gracious even in his judgment in this point. Verses 16 to 19. Then the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the earth that it may become gnats in all the land of Egypt. And they did so. And Aaron stretched out his hand with his staff and struck the dust of the earth. We're in a desert. So picture this, desert, <laughs> dust is everywhere. And there were gnats on man and beast. 
All the dust of the earth became gnats in all the land of Egypt. The magicians tried by their secret arts to produce gnats, but they could not. So there were gnats on man and beast. So people and animals affected alike. Then the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. So let's run over and let's take a look at this God. This God's name is Geb. He was the God of the earth. If you can see in the top, he's both pictures of him there are, I mean, that's both um, the top and the bottom guy are both Geb. Um, the top guy has those little um, rings that look like a cross with a loop at the top of it. And my producer, Josh, informed me that those are called Ankh and they are like the symbol of eternal life. So you see those a lot in the Egyptian pictures. And I always wondered what those were. So thank you, Josh, for filling me in on that. So he's got the eternal life, uh, you know, armlets and bracelets on and, and in his hands. And then the bottom picture of him, he's covered in, they drew leaves on him. So he, I guess he's just, you know, it's fall. He was rolling in the leaves. I don't know what he was doing. But anyway, he was a big deal because he was like the god of the soil. And of course, the soil is important for the crops, which are important for life and all of those things. So he was kind of a big deal god as well, small g god. Here's the thing. What we translate as gnats is a word that we kind of don't know exactly what it means. And, and this is pretty common when you're talking thousands of years ago, you know, was it gnats? Was it lice? Was it ticks? Was it fleas? All we know is it was some very, very small insect that it was really terrible for the people. So I tend to think of it, it was probably more like lice or fleas or ticks or something that would be like attaching themselves to your skin and, and biting you or sucking your blood, mainly because gnats are truly annoying, but all they really want to do is fly in your eyes, you know? So if you can cover your eyes, you can kind of deal with the gnats. Lice, on the other hand, oh no, please not that. Ticks, absolutely not. Fleas, mm, another really bad one. And you notice from the pictures that the Egyptians often shaved like all their body hair. They were very clean cut people, if you want to put it that way. Part of the reason, I'm sure it was partly aesthetic, like that was how they liked to look. But practically speaking, they did it because in these days, of course, lice and fleas and ticks and all of those things were a major problem. And where do those things like to go? They like to go in hair. So they would keep their bodies uh, and their heads very much shaved on purpose so that there was really no place for these things to go. You'll notice too, it says that the animals were also infested, which also makes me think it was probably something um, more along the lines of a blood sucking or biting insect. So the people, I picture them itching, scratching, we're getting skin diseases probably from these types of things. The animals are absolutely miserable. And there's just so many, so many swarms of these types of little insects. And the magicians, as we said earlier, they try, but they cannot replicate this one. Probably the people are thrilled. <laughs> Finally, they can't do it. Now, did God just stop it from happening because he was just done with it um, and, and took that power away from them? I don't know. We're not really told. We're just told that they can't do it. And all of a sudden it dawns on them. Like it took this many plagues for them to get the message. Hey, Pharaoh, we're dealing with something that is not one of our gods. This is the finger of God. It's the finger of another God. Uh, it fingers point at stuff. I think he's pointing at some things here. Can we just not maybe do this anymore? And Pharaoh, what a wicked, awful person he is. He's like, no, I'm, I'm going to keep rolling. So it doesn't appear as though the gnats go away. Um, maybe God just kept that going or the lice or whatever, or maybe he did take it away. And because of the economy of words in the Bible, we're just not given that little tiny section and we can assume it at any rate. We're not done with the plagues. So let's keep going here. Verses eight, I'm sorry, chapter eight, verses 20 to 21. Then the Lord said to Moses, rise up early in the morning and present yourself to Pharaoh as he goes out to the water and say to him, thus says the Lord, one second there before we go on, 
why would Pharaoh be going out to the water? Did you listen last week and maybe a couple of weeks prior to that? Not to bathe. He had much better places at the palace, much cleaner water, much more privacy. He's going to the water to do his ceremonial ritual cleansing to appease his gods. He doesn't get it at all. He's just not getting it. It's amazing that that's where he is with this. So God says to Moses, go down. I want you to um, approach him. And then this is what Moses is to say. Let my people go, send my people forth, technically, that they may serve me, not you anymore, me. Or else, if you will not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies on you and on your servants and your people and into your houses and into the houses of the Egyptians shall be filled with swarms of flies and also the ground on which they stand. Now, much like the gnats, we also don't know exactly what this is, but I think this is even more fascinating because the part that says of flies is nowhere in the original language. The translators added that to the text. It's not there. In fact, swarms isn't even exactly the word. The word is just simply mixed. I know. Mixed what? That's the problem. We don't know. It just sends, it says, I'm going to send you mixed and the mixed are going to be in your house. And so we have to sit back and go, okay, so we don't know exactly what this is. And a lot of commentators say, oh, we think it was wild animals. And, and others are like, no, it was definitely flies. Okay, we don't know. So here's what I just decided to do. Uh, first of all, I'm postulating here. I don't know either because I don't know what exactly he means by mix. But I did think to myself, okay, every single one of these plagues, as we've said, attacks a certain deity of the Egyptians. So it would stand to reason that whatever this is would be a really big deal for them, some deity. The other thing is, we haven't read it yet, but when we get to verse 24 here in just a moment, you're going to see that it says that whatever this mixed was, ruined the land. Now, I'm not an entomologist, so I don't know too much about insects. I'm not even sure I just said that word right. But anyway, whoever studies insects, not really my deal, don't really like them. But in my opinion, flies typically don't do a ton of damage to land. So what would swarm or be a, a mixed group of the same type of thing, but just mixed group, and would also ruin the land? Well, Here's a possibility. The god Kepri. Now you can see on that god Kepri that seems to have, oh, he's holding the, that eternal symbol too, the symbol of eternity. I see that. Um, you can see his head is this disgusting, what is that, a stag beetle or something? He's a beetle-headed guy. So Kepri was the god with the beetle head who created small suns. What does that mean? Is it stars in the sky or I, I don't know. But their sun god, Ra, was like the big cheese god. Like he was the number one god. So that the fact that this little G god would honor their main god was a big deal to them. I'm going to show you another picture. This is partly why they honored this beetle-headed guy so much. This is a picture of a beetle over, I presume, in that area of the world. And what these beetles would do in Egypt is that they would take like plants and dirt and waste material and they would roll it into a ball where they would lay their eggs. And then you can imagine when the eggs hatch, of course, <laughs> they come out of the ball. Well, they didn't know because it's so teeny, teeny, tiny that this beetle was actually laying eggs in the ball. In their minds, they just thought, this is amazing. This beetle creates life out of nothing. And look. He makes a small sun to honor Ra, the god of the sun. And so they really held this, this Kepri god in high esteem. In fact, so much so that when they were discovering mummies, they found some that actually were buried with beetles on top of them. So like a big beetle here and then wrapped, you know, and then they had beetles <laughs> that they had stuck, <laughs> this is so gross, in their ears on which they had inscribed the answers to questions that the afterlife gods might ask them so that 
they could hear the answers from the Beatles and they would know how to answer these gods in the afterlife so they could move on to whatever the next step was. So Beatles were a huge, huge deal. And not to get off on a tangent about it, but in my mind, I think it's a good candidate for what this plague actually is. So as we read the following verses, you're going to see I bracketed the words of flies. I didn't want to change what the Bible says, honestly, even though that's not in the original, just to let you know, it's not really in the original text. And I'm going to skip over those words because I think it just is a little more true to the original language to do that. But you'll see where it's happening. So um, I didn't take it out. I just bracketed it. So verses 22 to 24. But on that day, I will set apart the land of Goshen. This is God speaking, where my people dwell so that no swarm shall be there, that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. Thus, I will put a division between my people and your people. Tomorrow, this sign shall happen. And the Lord did so. There came great swarms into the house of Pharaoh and into his servants' houses throughout all the land of Egypt. The land was ruined by the swarms. So God now supernaturally protects his people, which indicates to me that the other plagues, even though it's not stated concisely and clearly, did affect those people. And last week, a lot of you, when we were asking questions, uh, were saying, I think it affected them because they had been worshiping Egyptian gods and they needed to know who the one true God was as well. So God probably was utilizing this to really get their attention, to prove that he was over those small G gods and more powerful and the one true God. And now he's going, all right, now that we've got your attention and, and you know that I am real and that I'm more powerful, now I'm going to mercifully cover you and protect you. So when the presumably beetles come, they're not going to be in the land of Goshen where you have been. And then I just thought too, how gracious of God to tell Pharaoh, this is going to happen tomorrow. Maybe God was mocking Pharaoh, like, you want to do tomorrow? I'll do tomorrow. I don't know. But it seems like a gracious act to me because Pharaoh had a whole day to think to himself, do I really want to keep fighting this God or do I want to just relent and, and submit and do what he's asking me to do? Well, obviously he does not relent. I don't know if he thought about it, but he certainly does not relent. Verses 25 to 27. Then Pharaoh called Moses and Aaron and said, go sacrifice to your God within the land. Don't miss that. But Moses said it would not be right to do so. For the offerings we shall sacrifice to the Lord our God are an abomination to the Egyptians. If we sacrifice offerings abominable to the Egyptians before their eyes, will they not stone us? We must go three days journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he tells us. Now, if it sounds like Pharaoh is being magnanimous here and trying to, you know, let's compromise, all right? You want to go sacrifice. I don't really want you to go. So how about this? He says, just sacrifice here. You can still sacrifice to the Lord your God. I will let you do it here in Egypt. No, he's not being nice. And fortunately, Moses and Aaron, number one, are committed to what God actually said and not trying to compromise God's word, which you never want to do. And number two, they were wise to him and they knew what he was trying to do. Remember how we said the frogs, you weren't allowed to kill them or you would get the death penalty? Well, frogs weren't the only sacred animal. There were lots of sacred animals. You pet lovers will be happy to know you couldn't kill dogs or cats either, not because they loved them as pets so much, although I think they kind of did, but because they also represented God. So anything that represented their gods, you were not allowed to kill. It was too dangerous to you personally and to the community and to the country as a whole to make these gods mad. So you couldn't kill them. Well, guess what the children of Israel were going to be slaughtering in their sacrifices to the Lord God? Cattle, amongst other things. And cattle were not to ever be touched. In fact, cattle were one of their main, highly regarded gods. So here's what Moses is saying. We're going to sacrifice cattle when we do this. And if we do this in Egypt, your people are going to kill us for doing it. So that's going to have to be no dice, hard no, try again, Pharaoh. 
Now, Pharaoh knew this. He was, I think, in his own mind, thinking to himself, I'm not submitting to this God. I, I will fight him to the bitter end, but I am getting really tired of this. So maybe I can defeat him by simply having all of his people get slaughtered by my people. Then, I, I mean, I lose all my slaves, not happy about it. However, all this stops because there's no more people to leave because they're all dead. By the way, sidebar, this is October 11th, 2023, that I'm recording this. We're on day five of the war of Israel against Hamas. And I'm sure this is going to spread to other terrorist groups if it's not already including them. Same demons, same Satan behind this as is behind what we are watching happen today. All the way back in the book of Genesis, we saw Satan try to wipe out the fledgling, teeny tiny, like family. It wasn't even a nation yet, but would become the Jewish people a nation. Tried to wipe them out then. He has tried over and over and over and over throughout the centuries and millennia to wipe them out and to take over their land. And God is going to win. So we continue to support Israel. We continue to pray that God will supernaturally protect this country and her armies that are fighting for her very existence right now. But I just think, again, how relevant is scripture that what we're reading right here, this idea that Pharaoh comes up with, it's the same idea as what we are experiencing today because it's the same demons behind all of it. Well, anyway, Moses just says, uh, no, we're not going to do that. <laughs> Sorry. No dice. Moving on to verses 20 to 32. So Pharaoh said, I will let you go to sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness. Only you must not go very far away. Plead for me. We'll address that in a minute. Then Moses said, Behold, I am going out from you, and I will plead with the Lord that the swarms may depart from Pharaoh for his servants and his people, I'm sorry, from his servants and from his people tomorrow. Only let Pharaoh not cheat again by letting the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. So Moses went out from Pharaoh and prayed to the Lord, and the Lord did as Moses asked and removed the swarms from Pharaoh and from his servants and from his people. Not one remained, but Pharaoh hardened his heart this time also and did not let the people go. I think Moses gives Pharaoh just a little tiny taste of his own medicine because Pharaoh's like, okay, 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 um, you can go, but just not very far. Did you notice Moses doesn't even respond? Not every pitch do you have to swing at in life. You know, sometimes you just bulldoze it right over. And that's what Moses does here. He doesn't say, well, I'm let's get back into the negotiation phase. Moses is done <laughs> negotiating back. He didn't even start negotiating. This is how it is. This is what God says. If you want to try to massage it and you want to try to compromise it and you want to try to change it, that's on you. I'm not even going to talk to you about that. We are leaving. We are going to do what God said. And God is the master over this entire situation, not you and not your gods. And he kind of puts Pharaoh in his place. And he says to Pharaoh, you're a compulsive liar. Stop doing that. This is not okay. You need to actually let the people go. And of course, Pharaoh has no plan whatsoever doing this. You know, we sit back and we look at Pharaoh. And we go, how stupid was this guy? But the thing is, he wasn't stupid. He's already exhibited some pretty good thinking skills. I mean, we just saw one right now where he's like, I know how I can fix this. I'll let them sacrifice here. He's strategizing. Um, back a, a while ago, he was doing the very same thing where he was turning the people against Moses and Aaron by punishing them instead of by punishing Moses and Aaron so they wouldn't get together and try to get out. So he's a good strategist and he has a high level of intelligence. You can see that here. What he is, is foolish. And often highly intelligent people, not always, but often the highest intelligent people are the fools because a fool says in his heart, there is no God. Or in this case, he acts like there is no God in the face of overwhelming evidence that A, there is a God, B, he is stronger than your gods and C, he is going to get his way. He continues to oppose him. 
So the thing I just want to leave you with this week is we asked this a couple weeks ago, but it's something I, I constantly go over in my own heart. Is there any area of my life where I am acting in opposition to God? Hopefully, you know Jesus as your Savior. Hopefully, you are one of his children. You have come to Christ in repentance for sins and have cried out to him to save you. He is your Lord and your Savior. But just because you've done that doesn't guarantee that there aren't points of time in our life when we act in opposition to him, knowing that that is what we're doing. So I challenge you, I challenge myself with this as well. This week, let's just do a little heart inventory on our own lives. Lord, is there any area of my life where I'm acting like a fool, where I, I know what you want me to do and I'm just flat out either saying no or passively saying no by simply like, da, 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 I'm just not doing it. <laughs> and I'm, I've done both in my life. It never ends well. The best thing we can do is to submit to God. It doesn't mean life will be easy, but it does mean that God will bless and lead you through whatever it is that you're going through. So let's just make sure that we keep soft hearts towards God and that we are always in submission to him and never acting in opposition to him. That is not a good place to be. Well, thank you so much for hanging out with me tonight. Now, next Monday night, which is October 23rd, 2023, we are taking the week off. We'll call it fall break. How about that? My work schedule just doesn't permit me to even record. I'm, I'm so busy. But we hope to come back the following week, Monday night, October 30th, 2023, 9 p.m. Eastern time, live, I hope, and we will get all of this going again and we'll hopefully finish up the plague. So thank you again. I love you all. I pray for you. Let's be active on our Facebook group, Bible Study Hub, encouraging each other and praying for each other. And of course, you can always catch videos later on our YouTube channel, Bible Study Hub. I'll see you next uh, two weeks. I'll see you in two weeks.